Thank you. Um, so, so, oh, sorry. Okay. So, um, Hegard flare homology is a, is a homology theory which associates uh, invariance to closed oriented three manifolds. And although um, it has been discovered roughly like 10 years ago by Peter Oswald and Zoltan Sabu, I think it's worth sort of very quickly run through the definitions of these objects. So Y will always denote a closed oriented three manifolds in the talk. And <coughs> the, the theory comes in, in various flavors. As you will see, the construction gives some freedom. And there are two main um, examples. What is denoted by HF hat, which is a finite dimensional vector space over the field of two elements, and HF minus, which is slightly more complicated. It's a finitely generated module over the ring of polynomials. And as I will try to indicate, the definition of these invariants is rather complicated. It involves uh, <coughs> a rather serious chunk of symplectic topology, namely uh, Lagrangian fleur homology. And the aim of the project I would like to talk about today is how to make it somehow simpler or more topological, more combinatorial, more computable. And so that will be the the main topic, uh, but as I mentioned, I would like to very quickly run through the definition. But before going through the definition, let me just give you some motivation why we would like to study such invariants. What can we do with these invariants? And I should emphasize that this is a, an ongoing joint project with Peter Oswald and Zoltan Sapo. So, um, so before going any further, let me mention that, of course, I was I was sort of uh, referring to these groups as finite dimensional Z2 vector spaces or modules over the polynomial ring with coefficients from Z2, but there is a natural generalization over Z and the real and the polynomial ring with integer coefficients. I will just be lazy and don't talk about signs at all. Also, the, <coughs> the groups admit natural splittings. There are structures attached to three manifolds called SPNC structures, which is a set parameterized by the first homology of the three manifold. And, uh, and these Hegard flare homologies naturally split according to these extra structures. Also, they admit homological splittings, homological gradings. So, for example, HF hat can be written as a, as a direct sum of subgroups which are indexed by some rational numbers, D, which is the, the homological grading, and some SPNC structures. And one further um, extension of the theory handles three manifolds which contain a prescribed knot. So we can associate invariant to pairs y, k, where y is as before a three manifold and k is a knot. And indeed, the, the same kind of generalization applies if we have a link in the three manifold. And these aspects will be sort of important towards the end of the talk. <coughs> And before going any further, why do we like these invariants? Why do we study them? The f so I just collected a few aspects of the theory. The first is that, indeed, by considering a slightly more structure, we can, uh, we can extend the definition to four manifolds. And it turns out that the four manifold invariants recover the Seibergwitten invariants of the four manifold. So for example, these invariants can be used to show that there are exotic differentiable structures on manifolds. And this is why I'm interested in this subject. Also, <coughs> it adds to classical knot theory. So the, the knot invariants I was referring to just a minute ago, they actually recover the cla such classical invariants as the Alexander polynomial of the knot, but they go way, way beyond that. For example, the invariants can be used to compute the cipher genus, the minimal genus of a surface bounded by the knot, or whether it is a fibered knot or not. This is, these are geometric properties of knots um, examined by knot theorists. Also, it provides an obstruction for sliceness, which can be used to construct exotic smooth structures on, on the four-dimensional Euclidean space. While in these studies, one needs the more complicated minus version of the theory. And it contains some really interesting information about the three-manifold. And I just picked one theorem, which was proved by Paolo Gigini and uh, Peter Oswald and Zoltan Sabo stating that suppose you have a three manifold which is constructed by minus one surgery on the left-handed trefoil knot. This is actually the Poincare homology sphere. 
which was discovered by Poincaré more than 100 years ago. And suppose you can get the same three manifold by surgery along another knot. And the statement is that then the two knots should be equal. So somehow the invariant contains some information which captures where the, the three manifold came from. You know, what is the source of the three manifold? It doesn't always hold for every pair of knot. It has to, it uses some specific properties of the trefoil knot. <laughs> but nevertheless, it really does contain some interesting information about the three manifold. Okay, um, let me just, again, make a brief comment about the extension to knots. So these uh, homologies are homologies of, <coughs> of filtrations on the, on the uh, chain complex of the underlying three manifold. So the way you should think about it is that here is a three manifold. We create somehow a chain complex and we, we take the homology, then we get the HF invariant. If we have a knot inside the three manifold, then we just gain an extra algebraic structure on the chain complex, nam namely a filtration. I will indicate that later on. And if we take the homologies of those filter chain complexes, more precisely the, the associated graded objects, then we get these invariants. So, um, okay. Um, and this is exactly the main strength of the whole theory. It gives a very nice connection between knots in three manifolds and surgeries performed along the knots. So this, this flexibility is a little bit in contrast with all the previously existing theories like Donaldson and Fleur homologies or cyborg witten homologies. <coughs> Here the, the, the connection is very direct and transparent. So, um, and let me just list a few more connections. So uh, these kind of ideas can be very conveniently used in studying contact structures on three manifolds and uh, there is an extension of knot theory where we just uh, examine special kinds of knots in S3 which behave in a prescribed way with respect to a fixed context structure called Legendrian and transfer, transverse knots. The invariants can be modified to, to say something interesting about those. We can study Stein surfaces using these invariants and links of isolated surface singularities. Um, there, is, there is a very important missing link, so somehow Three manifold topology these days is very heavily influenced by ideas of Thurston and work of Perelman, which center around geometric structures on three manifolds. And it's a, a sad uh, fact of life that we don't see the connection at the moment between Hegart Fleur homologies and these geometric structures. These geometric structures are very much attached to, to the fundamental group of the three manifold, and there is, a no, there is no direct or visible coincidence. Uh, correspondence between the fundamental group of the th three manifold and this Hegart Fleur invariant. So this is sort of a, <coughs> a direction for the future. Um, okay, so let me just start sort of outlining how these invariants are defined. So in order to do that, first I have to clarify how do I think about three manifolds. And I claim that if we have the following set of data, then we can construct a three manifold, namely we need a genus G surface, which will be always denoted by sigma. So it's like a closed, <laughs> compact two dimensional surface, which is oriented and it has G holes. And suppose we have a set of simple closed curves, alpha one up to alpha K. So K curves, which are disjoint <laughs> among themselves. And they have the extra property that if we consider the, the homology classes represented by them in the first homology of the surface, then the, spans, the subspace spanned by them is of dimension G. It has another reformulation, the same property just means that if you delete all these alpha curves, then what you are left with is a probably disconnected space, but all components should be punctured spheres. So somehow alphas will sort of cut all the genus, all the genera of the surface. Likewise, we consider a same set of curves, the betas. So an important property is that the betas and the alphas have to have the same number of curves. And again, the betas are disjoint among themselves, but they can, of course, intersect the alpha curves. And this is exactly the name of the game, to understand how complicated the two sets of curves are relative to each other. And finally, there is a set of points, this boldface W, which has the property that if we take the complement of all the alpha curves, 
then each component will contain a single point from this W. And likewise, if we delete all the beta curves, then each component will have a single W from that set. So for example, if we take uh, K to be equal to G, this exactly means that when we delete all the alpha curves, then we will still have a connected surface, which will be now a punctured sphere. And we need a single element in this W. And this is what's called a base point. OK. So um, all right, so this is sort of the incoming data. And I claim that this uniquely specifies a three manifold for me. In fact, it will specify a little bit more than that. But before telling you how, here is just a simple example. Here, the genus of the surface is two. And we have three curves, three alpha and three beta curves. The alphas are denoted by red, the betas by blue. And you see that somehow the alpha curves are, are sort of in a standard position. And this is always true. Somehow, one set of curves can be put in a standard position. And of course, then the other set of curves will be sort of interestingly or complicatedly located. And this is exactly what this invariant is supposed to measure. And you see that there is a W here and a W there. And it's not, e not hard to see that if you delete all the red curves, then the genus 2 surface will sort of fall into two components. Each component will look like a pair of pants. It will be a, a sphere with three, point, three boundary uh, curves. And each component will have a W. Likewise, if we delete the, the blue curves, the same will happen. OK, so this is a completely legitimate um, input. So how does it give us a three manifold? Well, I will call it a Hagar diagram. <coughs> and the way we construct the three manifold is the following. So first of all, we turn our surface sigma, which is a two-dimensional object, into a three-dimensional one by multiplying it with the unit interval. So it's sort of a thickened surface, <coughs> a genuine three-dimensional manifold with boundary. And now what I will do is I will just attach three-dimensional two handles along the alpha and along the beta curves. So what is a three-dimensional two handle? Well, I always picture it as like you take your breakfast bowl and you turn it upside down. So it's like a, th a, thickened, uh, a thickened disc, thickened in the, in the transverse direction, and the disc will be attached along these curves. So I try to make a sort of schematic picture. So this middle piece is sigma across the interval, and I purposely sort of tilted it a little bit, so both ends sort of look upward. And on one end, I copied all the beta curves. On the other end, I copied all the, all the alpha curves. And now I attach these, these upside down breakfast balls. So I sort of construct an, a three manifold still having boundary. And by this homological assumption accord, uh, about the, the alpha and the beta curves, it's very easy to see that what we will have after attaching all these handles, we will have boundary two-dimensional spheres. And then I just close it up by gluing the three-dimensional disks into them, and I get a closed three manifold. This is a rather s standard way of constructing uh, manifolds by attaching handles. And uh, um, before going any further, let me just mention what is the role of the base point. So the base points will play a very important algebraic role when I define the invariants. But what is their geometric significance? Well. <coughs> if you take the, I, I copy my fixed base point on both ends of this, of this product. And of course, in the product, I can connect the two copies of the base point. And then every base point will sort of com, uh, correspond to a unique disk in the last step of the construction of the three manifold. So they will somehow correspond to strings in the three manifold or arcs. So let me just, again, I copied the same kind of picture here. You see here is this W, which is the same as that W. They are connected in the direct product. And they will sort of go into the center of this disk here and into the center of this other disk there. And so what we have at the end of the day is that for every disk here, there is one single arc starting from the center going around the three manifold and going to the center of a disk in the other side. So you know, what we get is not only a three manifold, but a three manifold with as many strings in it as many base points we have. So for example, if G, the genus is equal to K, then we will have a single string. OK, so this is the geometric input. And now we, have, we would like to create a homology theory associated to that. 
So from now on, uh, when I think about the three manifold, it will be a four tuple, a surface, a set of alpha curves, a set of beta curves, and a set of points. So, uh, well, before going any further, of course, it's a legitimate question. What kind of three manifolds do we get in this way? And it's a fact, it's a standard fact in, in three-dimensional topology that you get every three manifold in this way. Uh, the presentation is not unique. The existence of this decomposition was already proved by, by Haygard, probably like 100 years ago. And eventually, it was already used by Poincaré in, in his um, construction of the Poincaré homology sphere. Um, and it can be used by, by ideas, simple ideas from, from Morse theory. But as I mentioned, this is not unique. The presentation is not unique. And this is always a problem. You, we would like to associate some invariant to the three manifold. And we presented it in some way. We would like to use this presentation to compute the invariant. And we want to make sure that it does not depend on the chosen presentation. So although it's not unique, there is a there is a simple set of moves which connect two such presentations, which uh, consists of isotopies, stabilizations, and handle slides. And instead of like defining what these are, I will just use this pictorial description. So isotopy is very simple. What we do is sort of we keep the blue curves intact, and we just move around the red curves, still keeping them disjoint among themselves. But they will change the. The intersection between the red and the blue curves will obviously change. So that's an isotopy. Handle slide is of something very similar. So remember that these red circles supposed to symbolize these upside down breakfast balls attached to the, to the three manifold. And now a handle slide means that I take one, my favorite breakfast ball and I sort of slide over the other one. So it just climbs over and then comes down on the other side. And the corresponding circles will look like that. It's a connected sum of the two circles. There are two stabilizations, which <coughs> the, the, the second one is easier to, to imagine. We just introduce two innocent looking little circles, one red and one blue. And of course, then we create a new component in the, in the complement. So we are forced to put a base point in between. And this is what we do here. And there is another stabilization, which already changes the, the surface, the Hagar surface sigma. So here, the black dots are supposed to mean that I take a, a tube and I sort of glue a tube to my existing surface along these disks. Or if you prefer, I just grab these two disks and as pancakes, I just squish them together. Or if you are more scientist, skiffy oriented, you think that it's like a time travel or something. So if you come in here in this end, then it will spit you out on the other end. So for example, this little blue arc between the two black dots is eventually a circle, right? It's a new beta circle, and it has its friend, a new alpha circle. So this is the stabilization. And the, the theorem is that if you have a three manifold and two presentation I, I described, then by a finite sequence of these moves, one can be transformed into the other. So when we would like to cook up an invariant of a three manifold, what we can do is we take a Hagar diagram, a diagram like that, we do a magic, we come up with some, in, some, some group or a vector space or whatever, and we show that if we apply one of these elementary moves, the result is unchanged, and then we get a three-manifold invariant. Okay, so this is exactly what we'll do. We have a, oops, okay, so we would like to associate a chain complex to this, to this four-tuple, and so <coughs> what we will do, we take the case symmetric power, where k is dictated by how many alpha and how many beta curves we have. We take this symmetric power of the, of the surface. Remember, it's just taking the Cartesian product and factoring out with the action of the, of the symmetric group. And in that symmetric power, we take the product of the alpha curves and likewise the beta curves. Of course, on the nose, it would depend on how you order the alpha curves. But luckily, we are in the symmetric power, so it doesn't really matter. And we get two k-dimensional tori in this two k-dimensional manifold. It's sort of a, I should pause for a second here as we always do, it's sort of a little magic. Somehow if you take the, the symmetric power of a, of a manifold, typically it's not a manifold because the Cartesian product is, but then you factor out with an action of a group and the action is not free. And typically if you have a manifold with a non-free group action, you, are, you start being worried that 
what you will get is not a manifold. Luckily, in that situation, if sigma is two-dimensional, what you get is exactly a manifold, and the underlying principle is just the fundamental theorem of algebra, and I will not elaborate why, but uh, it's a little kind of a magic that it works here. So now comes this big analytic chunk, which we really would like to avoid, is to run what's called Lagrangian Fleur homology for the pair T alpha and T beta inside that symmetric product. And I will not elaborate too much on that. I will just sort of highlight what does that mean. So, um, so the Lagrangian Fleur homology group in general is defined by a certain recipe which I translate in the current situation. What you have to do is you take these two half-dimensional tori. So these are like, you have to realize that these are like large dimensional tori in, in an even larger dimensional space, k-dimensional tori in a 2k-dimensional space. So in generic position, they intersect each other in finitely many points. So those will be the generators of the chain complex. What is an element of the intersection? Well, it is simply a k-tuple of points with the property that every alpha curve and every beta curve contains a single coordinate from that. So the way I phrased it is that the xi is in alpha i and in one of the betas and the index is determined from i by some permutation. So here is an example. These hollow circles will comprise a generator x. So here is one coordinate, the second and the third. And likewise, this full square y takes the same coordinate here, the same coordinate there, but it goes to the other intersection of the two, uh, two circles. Well, there is an alternative and obvious simple reformulation of the same, uh, the same set of generators. We can think about the, the uh, we can consider the following bipartite graph associated to this, uh, to this situation. For every alpha curve, I take a vertex AI, and for every beta curve, I take a vertex BJ, and I put an edge between uh, alpha uh, AI and BI, BJ, if and only if alpha i is connected by b to j. And of course, then I, I put as many, vert, as many edges between the two vertices, as many intersection points the two curves have. So in this way, I get a bar, bipartite graph, and the intersection points just simply correspond to perfect matchings of that graph. So I don't know how convincing it is, but somehow to describe the generators is a fairly simple combinatorial matter. And of course, this is not the complexity of the theory, the complication comes from uh, defining the boundary map on the homology. In order to do that, we have to equip this kth symmetric power with what's called an almost complex structure, a structure which makes us able to define holomorphic maps. And let's take the unit disk in the complex plane <coughs> and we'll consider a certain set of maps and we would like to count them and that will give us the boundary map in the, in the chain complex. Uh, so the, the precise definition, again, I will sort of restrict myself to a, to a diagram which will come in the next slide, but roughly speaking, it will just count the mod two number of holomorphic maps going from the disk into the symmetric power representing a fixed homotopy class sigma. So here is the, here is the rough idea so this is, my, this is the unit disk in the complex plane, and I colored the, the boundaries into blue and red, and I have these two preferred point i and minus i. And now I go to the symmetric power, and I consider all those maps which have the property that the blue part of the boundary should go to the t beta, the red part of the boundary should go to the t alpha, and i should go to x, and minus i should go to y. If I consider all the smooth maps, of course, I will get either a gigantic space or infinite dimensional or something empty or something like that. To rigidify the situation, we only consider holomorphic maps. That's why we had to choose the, the almost complex structure on the, on, the, on the target. And again, sometimes we have a 20 dimensional space. Sometimes this space is one dimensional. Notice that if there is a single such map, then there is a whole one dimensional many of them because the unit disk has these holomorphic automorphisms, which can be exactly parameterized by R. So what we'll do, those maps are sort of morally the same, but they look a little different. We quotient out by this action. And then hopefully at some 
cases we get zero dimensional spaces and then we will just count those. So the, the coefficient nxy is just the count of those holomorphic maps and now we are ready to define the, uh, the chain complex. So again, the chain complex is, is generated by all the intersection points over this polynomial ring and the boundary of an, of an intersection point x is simply a linear combination of further intersection points y where the coefficients can be taken from the, from the polynomial ring, again with z2 coefficients. And so I take this number of holomorphic maps and I multiply it with this mysterious term, formal variable u raised to the power, which is defined by how many times this holomorphic disk intersects the, uh, the divisors defined by the base points. So every base point, uh, there is a, a co-dimension two subspace in the symmetric power corresponding to every base point, namely those k-tuples, unordered k-tuples of points which do contain this prescribed base point as one of their coordinates. So, you know, mathematically this is what we write here and we measure how many times this phi intersect that those, those uh, uh, co-dimension two um, submanifolds. So this is what the, the, the boundary map is. The specific uh, theory CF had is gotten by taking u equals zero in this case. If you take u equals zero in this polynomial ring, you just get rid of all the polynomials except the constant ones. So you will have like a z2. And also in the boundary map, this term will vanish and it will be always zero if, uh, if this nw is positive. And if this happens to be zero, then you get a zero to the power zero there. So it's a one. So in another way, we just, in other, in other words, we just, look for those phi's which actually avoid those prescribed submanifolds. And it turns out that this theory is much simpler. So the, the main theorem of this, this whole subject is a theorem of Peter Rojvat and Zoltan Sobo saying that what we will get in this way is really a chain complex, namely the square of the boundary operator is zero and the, uh, the homology of the chain complex will be a topological invariant of the three manifold. The chain complex itself cannot be an invariant because for example, the number of intersection points will depend on which alpha and beta curves you choose, but the homology will be uh, independent. And of course the original proof of the invariance and the setup both uses um, the polymorphic geometry or almost holomorphic geometry attached to uh, to uh, Lagr uh, Lagrangian for homology. Um, let me just make a, a simple remark. So remember when we take this four tuple, sigma, alpha, beta, and w, I sort of try to convince you that it gives us a three manifold together with, with strings in it. What happens if instead of taking one set of w's, I take two sets of w's, then of course I will get two sets of strings which will form in the three manifold a knot or a link depending on the combinatorics, how they, how they are attached to each other. So by taking two sets, we can represent all knots and links in three manifolds. And this uh, gives us that, that flexibility I was referring to before, which is a connection between the three manifolds and the, and the knot invariants. Um, this was observed by Peter and Zoltan and independently by Jake Rasmussen in 2003. And so in the algebraic terms, we use this Z by not changing the chain complex, but adding an extra structure in it, namely a, namely a filtration. I will not go into the details how, but uh, it's a, it results in a very powerful um, invariant. So, uh, so how to compute these invariants? Obviously the computation is sort of challenging because although it's not so hard to come up with the set of generators, but the boundary map uh, asks you to understand how many holomorphic maps you have from the disk into a really high dimensional space with weird boundary conditions. So th on, the, on the first level, you would like to just give you a computational scheme, like how to compute these invariants. The next level would be to actually define the invariants without referring to this holomorphic theory, show the independence without referring to, to this heavy analysis. And of course the third level would be to, to come up with sort of an effective way to computing this invariance. 
The, the parallel story you have to keep in mind is somehow homology theory. So when you define homologies of a space, the most convenient way to define it is what's called singular homology, where you, where you sort of invoke all the maps from a fixed simplex into your topological space. And it's clear that you cannot make any computation with that definition except for the point or something like that. It's much more convenient to do um, to consider simplicial homology where you already take a triangulation of your space and then the whole theory is very geometric and obvious what happens. But most of the time in this way you still get gigantic chain complexes. And there is sort of an intermediate theory which is called CW homology where still you have a good grasp of what's happening but the generators are much smaller in number. So if I have to summarize where the theory stands at this very moment. So we, so uh, work of Peter and Zoltan sort of uh, set up this, the, sim the singular theory. We have a, a simplicial version more or less and it still has to be worked out what's the corresponding theory for the CW case. So how to make it effectively computable. Um, okay, so um, so we go to the, the first question, how to compute these invariants, and I will focus on the, the hat version for the moment. So the, the, the breakthrough came from, from two uh, graduate students, Sarkar and Wang, in 2006, where they claimed that if you pick your Hagar diagram specifically enough, then in fact the, uh, the invariants can be computed purely combinatorially. And the specific property they required is that the diagram should be nice, which means that each and every component of the complement of these alpha and beta curves should have a very simple shape. It can be either a bigon, it can be a rectangle, or if it is neither of them, that it must contain a base point. So here are the, the three possibilities. So a, a bigon means a, a component of the complement of the alpha and beta curves bounded by a single alpha and a single beta. Rectangle is when you have two alpha and two beta, and the rest should be, they can be arbitrarily complicated, but they all have to contain a base point. So of course the first question is whether any three manifold admits such a Hagar diagram, and that was their, their, their theorem back in 2006, that indeed every closed three manifold admits a nice Hagar diagram. And their I idea was to sort of take whatever Hagar diagram God gives for the three manifold, grab the beta curves and massage them until you get rid of all the complicated domains. Whenever you see a complicated domain, you would like to travel with a beta curve to cut it into sort of simpler domains and you push your, your isotopy all the way into a domain which contains a base point. The base point is somehow like, you know, in your computer screen, it's like the trash, right? You can just push everything, what you don't like, into that domain. And that's what they did. <coughs> and uh, that was one part of their, their uh, solution. And the second was a proof that in fact nice domains are nice in the sense that the boundary map eventually can be uh, pr computed combinatorially. Remember the way we defined or Peter and Zoltan defined the boundary map was to choose an almost complex structure and measure how many holomorphic maps you have. And in, in generic cases, of course, the boundary map will depend on the chosen almost complex structure, and that's a very frightening fact. It's very hard to sort of um, model uh, an almost complex structure combinatorially. So what they proved first is that in a nice diagram, in fact, the choice of the almost complex structure doesn't matter. For any almost complex structure, you will have always the same, same boundary map, and I wrote out what the boundary map counts in this case. The actual details are not very interesting, but sort of you should take my word for it. It's a simple matter of computation once you see the diagram. So you, you just have to check how many different coordinates X and Y do you have. Remember, in my example, they had two common and one differing coordinate. And if they are equal or they have at least three different coordinates, then the boundary map is just zero. And if they have one or two different coordinates, then you have to, to um, count simple geometric objects on the surface. So this sort of brings you to a very simple um, computational problem. 
Um, and in this, in this way, if you have a nice diagram, you can associate to it, you can completely forget about holomorphic geometry and you just write down a chain complex motivated by these identities which associates a combinatorial version of Hegard fleur homology to a nice diagram. And of course, the next level would be to show that it's independent of the chosen nice diagram. And this is exactly the content of the next theorem which we proved with Peter and Zoltan a few years ago that this is exactly the case. Well, we had to modify a little bit the definition by, by allowing some stabilization procedure, except when the manifold is simple enough, it's a rational homology sphere, then we just recovered the, uh, the honest Hegard fleur groups, at least the hat version, using this combinatorial approach. So um, let me just give you an idea of the proof in a nutshell. So instead of taking any kind of, uh, of nice diagrams, we, we restricted ourselves to very, simple, uh, very special ones. Namely, we started with a sigma alpha beta, where alpha and beta, these sets of curves, have the particular property that they will give pair of pens decompositions. Like in, our, in my example, it was exactly like that. So you have to have exactly 3G minus 3 curves for a genus G surface such that if you delete all of them, then all the components will look the same and they will look like a pair of pens. And then um, we refined it until it became nice. And once we had that, we considered the, the uh, associated uh, combinatorial chain complex and we showed that by these elementary moves of handle slides, isotopies, and stabilizations, it doesn't change. Um, well, I don't want to go into the proof of that, but I would like to show you a way how to, uh, how to show that every three manifold has a nice diagram based on these ideas. I went to Richard Taylor's talk a few weeks ago and he said that, you know, uh, giving a math talk without a proof is like having a Hollywood movie without the love scene. So we don't want that, right? So uh, let me just give you the, uh, the quick idea how to give a nice, diagram for any three manifold. Well, I will restrict myself to sort of special uh, three manifolds which have no S1 cross S2 summons, but three manifolds are like numbers. They have a unique prime decomposition and uh, S1 cross S2, you can think of that as being a very special prime, namely the number two. So I will just argue for odd numbers or three manifolds which don't have this summon, but it can be fixed easily at the end. So <coughs> suppose that we have a, a, a Hegar decomposition sigma alpha beta where both alpha and beta provide a pair of pens decomposition of the surface and then we will refine it until it becomes nice. Um, well, so first of all, we assume that there are no bygones, which means that if two curves intersect each other sort of in an unnecessary way, creating a bygone, uh, we will just isotope them away. And since this operation, decreases the number of intersection points and there are only finitely many, it will eventually terminate in a diagram which has no bygones. That's good. And also the, our assumption will work in our favor by um, implying that there are no isolated alpha and beta curves. So it means that every alpha curve will be intersected by some beta and vice versa. If you know that, then every component, oops, every component of the complement of the alpha curves will look like one of these basic examples. So I hope you see this pair of pens. I mean, the, the inner part of this circle deleted the, the two smaller circle. And the beta curves will cut into that, uh, that domain. And because there are no bygones and no isolated curves, these are the three prototypes where each blue arc is symbolizing a number. We don't know how many parallel blue arcs. So we are almost done. You remember, I, I didn't tell you where to put down the base points and this will be sort of the magic. Whenever you see a bad domain, you would like to put down a base point there and then the rest will be only bygones and, and rectangles. The problem is that in each uh, component, we are allowed to put down a single base point and here we have two hexagons. This is a hexagon because if we start here, this is one side, two, three, four, five, and then we go back and this is six. So we have two hexagons here, two hexagons there, a single octagon here. So this is not a problem, but these are problematic. And what we do, we just introduce new curves. So we just add 
a new curve like this here, and then we gain the right. We just cut this comp component into two, so we gain the right to put down two base points, and here are the two base points, and likewise here, and just for symmetry I did the same here, although it's not strictly necessary. Of course, remember we have the same number of alpha and beta curves, so in principle something might go wrong because now we have to go to the blue curves and do the similar adjustment, and in principle you might imagine that it looked nice, fine, and then you add the beta curves and then you just somehow create some trouble, but this doesn't happen, and I told you it's only the idea of a proof, not a full proof, but it goes well with the analogy of the Hollywood movies. So for the love scenes, you always see the idea, but not, you know, the, the details you should work out <laughs> by yourself. Um, okay, so the, the, what we really gain is that we, we have to work inside pair of pants or unions of two pair of pants, which we usually call t-shirts. And that's a, a main uh, simplification compared to the general case where you have a genus G surface. So for example, if you consider the mapping class group of these objects, these are like infinitely many times simpler than a, a high genus surface. With the same effort, we were able to, to uh, lift the theory over Z by associating orientations and uh, the spin C structures can be incorporated knots and link fleur homologies in the same way for the hat version. Well, computability is a problem because when you, when you turn a diagram into nice, typically we, you introduce lots and lots of new intersection points. So there is this sentence that nice diagrams are typically horrible in that sense. In, in our case, we introduce new curves and more and more possibilities for new coordinates. So typically for computational aspects, it's completely out of hand. <coughs> okay. So this was the age of hat theory. And as I sort of indicated at the beginning, for the four dimensional applications or for slice, uh, sliceness obstructions, what you really need is the minus theory. But this idea doesn't work. You know, for the hat theory, what we did is we sort of considered diagrams where all complications are in the domains which contain the base point. And we only considered those holomorphic disks which sort of avoided those domains. So we were in the complement of the complexity. And for HF minus, you are not supposed to, to do that. You should allow all the curves, and you have to count how many times they go through the complicated domains. So these, I these, these ideas don't work. And so what we did is um, we restricted ourselves to simpler three manifolds. So suppose that G is a weighted tree, so which means that it's like a good old regular tree and we, we attach to every vertex an integer, which I will denote by mv. So to every such weighted tree, there is a simple construction of associating a four manifold bit boundary, which I will denote by xg, and the boundary will be our, our uh, object of interest, a three manifold, a closed oriented three manifold yg. And the way you associate to it is we just take the, for every ver vertex, I consider an S2, a two-dimensional sphere, and the D2 bundle over that sphere. And for every edge, I plumb together the two uh, disk bundles. Well, uh, it's sort of hard to do pictures in four dimensions, but I try to do it in half dimensions. So suppose this is, uh, uh, these are our two vertices connected by this edge. And so instead of taking S2, now I consider S1, which is symbolized by this dotted line. And instead of a D2 bundle, I consider a D1 bundle over it. Of course, there are two D1 bundles over the circle, the trivial one, what I just drew, and the Möbius band. And so whenever you see two such vertices connected, what you do is you plumb the two bundles together in a way that what was sort of fiber direction in one becomes a section direction on the other and vice versa. So you sort of uh, interchange the directions. And you can do it in, in the four-dimensional word, and what you get is a plump four manifold xg with boundary yg. And now <coughs> I would like to describe a, a homology theory associated to, to the graph and hope for the best that what we'll get is exactly what we would like to get. So this was, this was initiated by András Németi a few years ago based on uh, computations of Zoltán and Peter for specific graphs, 
And so we do the following. We take all the characteristic elements uh, as, uh, attached to this graph G, which just means that we take all the maps from the vertex set V into the integers which satisfy this congruence. So somehow the, the value of K is, not, is restricted by its parity on every vertex V. So we take this set, obviously it's an infinite set, and uh, if we have a, a function like this, or a, I will call them characteristic cohomology classes because they correspond to cohomology classes in the Plumb 4 manifold XG. So if we have a K like that and the subset I of the vertex set, then we sort of define a weight associated to that pair Ki. Namely, we just evaluate our function on every element of I, and then we just take the homological square of the sum of these, uh, these elements. You remember, I mean, the product of two vertices is zero or one, depending on whether they are connected or not, and the square of a vertex is just the framing we fixed on that. So we just get an integer, integer here, and it's not hard to prove that exactly because of this characteristic property, it will be an even integer, so the half will be still an integer. Um, this can be reformulized by taking this other expression, but this will be not very important for us. And now I associate two numbers, oops, two numbers, which I wrote down, down here, to every pair key, K and E, namely, I just take the minimum of all these values when I runs through the complement of V or I runs through those subsets of V which do contain this prescribed vertex V. So, you know, so far there is no mention of holomorphic or anything. It's a very simple combinatorial matter to actually compute these, these quantities. And uh, the chain complex is defined as follows. So the generating set of the chain complex, again, over the polynomial ring with Z2 coefficients, and again, Z2 is not important here. We could do it over the integers by discussing orientation issues. I will not do that. So the, the, the generating set consists of all the cohomology classes, characteristic cohomology classes, and all the subsets of the vertex set. So we get, obviously, it's an infinite linear infinitely generated Z2U module. And the boundary map is given here. So the boundary of a generator is given by taking the same generator except I drop V from the, from the set E. And here I modify the cohomology class by adding twice the Poincaré dual of, of, uh, of V, where V star is just the, the function which takes zero on the vertices which are not connected to V, one on the ones which are connected to V, and on V itself, it just takes the, the framing uh, prescribed for V. And again, we just drop one element from the, from the set. <coughs> and both are multiplied by some polynomial in U, and this will be actually a monomial, where the exponent is given by these A and B I wrote down before. So morally, little a and little b are exactly the same as a, b, except we normalized it by subtracting the common minimum. And in this way, we achieve that these are non-negative numbers, and in fact, one of them will be always 0. So the combinatorial structure of the, of the boundary map is rather simple. Of course, we have to pay a high price for it. So in all the previous occasions, we had a big dimensional compact manifold and two compact transversely intersecting submanifolds, so their intersection set was always finite. So all or modules and vector spaces were finite. Here, oops, here I just took too many generators. There are too many characteristic elements. Even if you have a graph with a single uh, vertex, you have infinitely many generators. So this is a slightly more complicated object, but you know, what you gained by allowing too many generators, you got a boundary map which is very simple to describe. Um, okay, so we just take the homology of this chain complex, and uh, so this was introduced again by, by Nemeti a few years ago, and he actually showed the following theorem. So, um, first of all, he always considered negative definite graphs because his interest comes from singularity theory and uh, a singularity can be always described by a negative definite plumbing graph, and now we assume that it's a very specific plumbing graph. It's, it's actually a tree. So the, th the theorem is the following. Uh, 
before the theorem, let me just tell you a definition. So we say that the vertex is bad if the sum of the, of the framing attached to the vertex plus the degree plus the number of, of edges emanating from that vertex is positive. So, you know, this is always a non-negative number. And since we always assume that we are working with negative definite graphs, MV will, will be always negative. At bad means that it's sort of not negative enough. It's sort of too close to zero, so this sum will be positive. So in this case, Nemeti proved that if G has at most one bad vertex, then the lattice homology, this homology group, is actually isomorphic to the Hegart Fleur homology group of the, of the three manifold given by the, the plumbing. So in particular, for example, this will be a finitely generated ZU, ZU module. No, 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 sorry, yeah, uh, the, the, the minus version. So they will be isomorphic as modules over the polynomial ring. So it's, the, it's really what we want, the complicated version, except this idea doesn't work for all the three manifolds. It only works for, for plumbing three manifolds. And I don't like to say it in public, but you should know that like 0% of the three manifolds are really plumbings. You know, like, <laughs> oh, so <laughs> this is off the record. <laughs> No, I mean, the, the, the statement is that somehow like 100% of the three manifolds are hyperbolic and we don't know how to use these ideas. 0% of them are, are, uh, are plumbings. When it comes to three manifolds you actually work in your everyday life, then the ratio is a little different. Like, you know, it, it, it is almost, almost like 98% of the three manifolds you meet are plumbings and the rest are hyperbolic. We don't understand them very well. So for example, all ciphered fibers are all plumbings. They are very special plumbings. They are like these star-shaped plumbings. So there is only one vertex which has degree more than two. In particular, they are all, oops, they all have one bad vertex. So for ciphered fibers, this, this theorem is already enough. Um, okay. Um, so there are all the, the usual tools of, of Hegart Fleur homology which work in, in this lattice homology. So for example, Josh Greeney and Nemeti showed that they admit a surgery exact triangle, which I don't want to describe, but it sort of gives a relation between different three manifolds. And also Nemeti found a number of exciting uh, connections to singularity theory. So for example, he proved that these groups have the, the, the simplest possible algebraic structure, namely they are a one-dimensional module over Z2 if and only if the corresponding singularity is a rational singularity. Whatever it means, it's a well-studied class of singularity theorists and it seems to be nicely mirrored by the algebraic structure of this, this invariant. Um, okay, so um, recently we also found some results in this respect. So we showed that there is a spectral sequence which starts from the lattice Fleur homology and it abuts to the uh, Hegart Fleur homology, again HF minus. And indeed, this spectral sequence collapses if the, if the graph has at most two, or in the ne negative definite case, at most three bed vertices, which means that for those graphs, we see that the two, theor two theories are actually isomorphic. So it's sort of a a little extension of the, of the theorem of Nemeti, which talked about one bad vertex. And so, you know, somehow you might think that one is, a, is, a, is an important barrier, but this theorem says that no, I, I don't think there is any problem with more bad vertices. Um, and we also sort of incorporated this idea of, of uh, associating invariance to knots in three manifolds. You remember I sort of tried to outline how to enhance uh, Hegart Fleur homology to knots in three manifolds. The corresponding uh, theory here goes as follows. So let's take now a, a graph gamma, which has the property that it's not really a weighted graph. Every vertex has a weight except one. So if you delete this V naught, which doesn't have a weight, then you really get a weighted graph. We can consider the Hegart Fleur homology, or the, sorry, the lattice Fleur homology of this, this weighted graph, which is H of minus of G, and we showed 
that the, the extra vertex induces a filtration on that, on that algebraic object. <coughs> and uh, this pair of the filter chain complex together with this filtration will behaves exactly like th the case of, of uh, not fleur homology in Hagar fleur homology. Um, so just to show you that still there is no magic in here, just bookkeeping, I just told you what the, what the filtration is. So the filtration is given by associating a single number for each generator of that chain complex of the background uh, weighted plumbing graph. And we do it in the following way. We just take an extension L of K. So K associates to every vertex of G a number and gamma has one more vertex. So if we would like to extend it to L, we just have to prescribe one single value L of V naught. And the, the defining property is that once we did that, the corresponding A and D values, which we used in the, in the boundary map, should be equal. And since one of them should be equal to zero, this means that both should be equal to zero. So it's a simple property and we have to show that there is a unique such extension and this always ex exists for every k. But once you have that, then we just take this, this value. Again, the particular form is not important, but it's very simple to define. And what we get is a filter chain complex. And uh, so what can we sh do using these filter chain complexes? Well, if we attach now a framing to this V naught, which corresponds to the doing surgery along a knot in the Hagar Fleur world, then the, the, the uh, filter chain complex is enough to compute the lattice homology of the new uh, weighted graph. Um, we also managed to prove that, reprove a theorem of Nemeti that in fact, the lattice homology is the invariant of the boundary three manifold and it's not, it does not depend on which plumbing graph presentation you take for the, for the three manifold. And this is work in progress. You know, the details are not still not worked out completely, but it shows that if we have a negative definite graph, then in fact the two theories will be isomorphic. And what we gain by having this, uh, this not version of, of uh, lattice fleur homology is that sort of there is a, there is a free vertex and you, this makes you able to do induction. And this is what we capitalize in proving that the two theories are equal. Again, unfortunately, theoretically, the new chain complex is very simple. It's very, very, very simple how to define the boundary mass, but it has infinitely many generators. So it's still not sort of uh, very handy in actual computations. Uh, there are some work done um, sort of cutting down the computational complexity. We try to find sort of smaller sets of generators by contracting the homologies and see what are the important parts in computing the homology. And there are students of Nemeti working on, on similar projects, but uh, this is still lies in the future and I hope at some point we will be able to understand it much better. Um, I think this is all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you for your attention.